Feast TV is brought to you with the support from Missouri Wines, Caldi's Coffee, Old Time Produce, and the Raphael Hotel. Let's get cracking. This is the egg episode. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. Eggs are ubiquitous. They're in everything from hollandaise sauce to brioche to meatloaf. So we are focusing this episode on the incredible edible egg. We're starting off at Blue Heron Farms near Springfield, where they produce chicken, duck, and goose eggs. Check it out. So we're standing here on a misty October late afternoon, and I'm here with James Boozy. Love the name. Thank you. Um, is this a natural pond, or did you yes, put the pond it's in? Yes, it is. It's actually a spring-fed pond, but uh, yes, it's a natural pond. That's fantastic. Yeah. We have a lot of water on the property, so it's a great habitat for waterfowl. Is that why you chose the property? Sort of. We were looking for a property of this type, and this was available. We just wanted a nice piece of land that had sort of varied terrain and lots of natural resources that we could then work with that. And now you have ducks and geese and chickens and cows and pigs and sheep. That's correct, yes. We have everything. <laughs> and yeah. dogs We're, and We kids. are a mixed farm. <laughs> Our approach to farming is a little bit old fashioned. We're a mixed farm, but every element is cooperative. And we try very hard not to add anything new until we've mastered or at least are adept at what we were doing before. So for example, we started with chickens and then we added the ducks and then we added the geese and we started with pigs and then we added the cows and we added the sheep. But every time we do something like that, we make sure that it's balanced and we make sure there's a purpose for it, there's a market for it, and they all work together. That's really important. And it's the same with what we grow. We started with the microgreens, uh, and then the last two years we've been working a lot on the gardens and finding our niche with growing. So we try to grow fairly specialist things that are a bit more unusual or have really good flavor. And I think flavor is a core of what we do. We're, we're kind of obsessive about that. We want to make sure that everything we produce is the best. Um, for me personally, I'm not interested in quantity. Uh, I would rather work with a few people really, really well and produce the highest quality food that we can produce. That's kind of the approach that we take. And our ultimate aim is to do everything. We want to prove that a mixed farm can produce all food. So we could literally supply a family of all their food, or we can supply a restaurant, all their food. That's, that's our ambition. And we're probably 60% of the way there, I would say. We want to be, I suppose, the cliche self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. We find that diversification helps. Um, and also, that's why we did it. We weren't doing it for commercial means initially. And then I have a restaurant background, so I started selling to restaurants, and it's kind of snowballed from there, really. And then, obviously, the duck eggs, the popularity has been huge. You don't see duck eggs readily available. No. You really are bringing something to market that is unique. Yes. We're one of the few in Missouri that's raising ducks, particularly like this. Once people try them, they prefer them because duck eggs are much richer. I mean, they're obviously alkaline as opposed to acidic like a chicken egg. So they have a milder, creamier flavor and they're just heartier, you know, they're more satisfying and they have a lot more yolk, which is what everybody wants. Absolutely. So tell me about your geese, because you have geese as well. We got geese for two reasons. I like them and I think it's very, uh, I don't know, traditional farm. Mm -hmm. You've got a goose and they've always been used as watch animals. That's predominantly what they're for because they have extremely acute instincts and anything that's not right, they will alert you to by honking oh, wow. and screeching. 
and right now they're really protecting these guys you know if if there's any kind of predator they're going to know about it and alert us to it and they'll alert the dogs to it the dogs are trained to it and then they also lay eggs mm -hmm. and a goose egg is i think probably the finest egg you can eat really yes uh they're obviously huge uh they're a very seasonal treat you only get them for a few months of the year and uh, they're just delicious. So how many ducks do you have compared to chickens? It's a fairly equal number. Uh, I would say we have between three and 400 chickens and three and 400 ducks. Now I know that's uh, quite a lot difference, 100, but uh, I've given up counting. So we also have one Jersey cow called Mimi. She's our milk cow. What do you think of that, Mimi? You're gonna be famous. Yes, the two boys. These are Berkshire pigs. They're a great pig. He's a friendly chap, aren't you, Bear? Sometimes he rolls over. Oh, there we go. <laughs> go on all the way. Go on. Go on. Go on. <laughs> so there you go. So we've seen where eggs come from, and I think it's about time we head over into the kitchen and see how they're used. So let's head to Yolklore in St. Louis. So we're standing here in Yolklore. Now, Mary, how did you come up with the name, first of all? Well, we actually sat down with Almanac, a branding company that my good friend Nate Spray owns, and he helped us. It was like a three-hour session. They brought all these crazy names, and it was so funny. We laughed for like three hours <laughs> over these names, and we kept coming back to Yolklore. It was one of those things like we said it over and over and over again, and it either gets to sound really weird when you say it, or you're like, no, I still like it. The concept for this is that it really is a breakfast-centered right. right. idea. So why did you want to do something like that as opposed to like a traditional kind of lunch dinner kind of a spot? I love the hours, honestly, and I love the daytime. I like the no fuss. You know, we're kind of able to reinvent some things and people see breakfast in a different light. Everything's homemade from scratch. It's all top notch. Yeah, exactly. So we wanted Yolk Lore to be the story of the egg and have that be, you know, us telling our story. I would say for years, eggs have been kind of trendy as an ingredient, sure. but um, what is it about an egg that kind of makes it something that you could tie an entire restaurant concept around it? So you can do eggs in so many different ways that, you know, it never gets old, really. You know, you use local eggs here. Mm -hmm. Why bother to source locally? What's the difference? The texture of the egg is just completely different and the taste, it's just natural and rich. And once you've had a farm egg, it's hard to go back. And if you're gonna build an entire menu around eggs, you have to use top yeah. quality. Yeah, and it's crazy when you're like, this just tastes like so eggy, you know? <laughs> well, I think it's time we get in the kitchen and taste some of those eggs. Yes. All right, let's go. So, John. Hi. Hi. Um, so tell me about your eggs because they are gorgeous. Yes. These eggs come from Buttonwood Farm. We use two different sizes, medium and large. These here in front of us are the mediums. And this is our sous vide machine. For those of you at home, you may have heard of people cooking something sous vide. 
but all that is is really a water bath. It's also called an immersion circulator, right? Correct. What it does is it regulates the temperature of the water to a tenth of a degree and it circulates the water. So we have this water bath at 167 degrees. Okay. So the temperature of the water is what's going to cook the white and the amount of time that it's in the water will cook the yolk. What do you want the result to be? We want this to be a very soft poach creamy and milky when you break it with a spoon. So the white is just perfectly set and the yolk is still runny and gooey and excellent. Perfect. Yes. So why cook an egg this way rather than just poaching it in the traditional way in water? Well, the nest egg is our signature dish and we serve a lot of them. So I can sous vide 30 eggs at a time and have 15 orders ready in half the time. Awesome. All right. So. Show me how you do this. First off, our eggs are at room temperature. Our water is at the appropriate temperature. And the first step is just putting them here on our little strainer. I'm going to drop them in. And they cook for 13 minutes. So we'll let these hang out and cook in our little water bath. OK. And then we'll start to roll the biscuit and then we can assemble the nest egg. All right, I'm ready to get my hands dirty. Let's make some biscuits. Yes. We have a very simple biscuit recipe, very straightforward, awesomely delicious. Now here, that is humongous. Oh my God. It's gonna make us about 60 biscuits. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, feeling strong? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna yep. fold this like this. Yep. And then I flatten it down. down. Yeah. This is a great way to get aggression out. That's perfect. <laughs> I'm going to scooch this baby over. So all these chunks and layers of fat in here That's what are makes it awesome. Good. Yeah, exactly. Like you can see yeah. little chunks of butter all throughout yeah. the dough. And that's why they get fluffy and, mm -hmm. and pop in the oven. That's going to be awesome. So we're going to roll it to about an inch thick. This is so satisfying. Right? Yes. Wow, okay. do you need a second job? Yeah, I do actually. Perfect. I have nothing to do. Perfect. <laughs> I'll stop by a couple times a week and help you with the biscuit. This is it. We're done. Yeah. Don't be shy, biscuits. Don't be nervous. You're getting your close up today. Don't look at the camera. Yeah, don't look at the camera. <laughs> John has taken me through the basics of putting together the nest egg, which is a signature dish Correct. here at Yolklore. I'm gonna try to do it on my own and try not to mess it up. All right. You can do it. Definitely. I can do it. I can you do can it. definitely do it. All right, so. First step is to put the nest egg shell into the oven. Yes. I'm gonna pick the prettiest one. I'm just gonna pick the closest one. So I take this, put it in the oven, which as John has told me, is very hot. <laughs> yes, hot things are hot. <laughs> now we can put our two sous vide eggs into the biscuit crust. Good. You see how we talked about earlier how the white is set, but yeah. the yolk is, will still be runny when we crack it open. That is gorgeous. Oh, that looks perfect. Well, there you go the nest egg. That was so much fun. Now I get to eat it. Yeah, that's the best part. <laughs> now you get to eat part. it. So we've seen how eggs are critical to a perfect breakfast, but they're also an important ingredient in ramen. So next up, we're heading to Kansas City. So first off, how did you get into ramen? I've always liked noodles, made lots of noodles, and then my love for Asian food. It's always probably my favorite food to cook. 
at a ramen shop in Portland, I had like an epiphany moment, you know? Yeah. I was kind of sitting there eating and I was just like, this is what I want to do, this is it, you know? I was at a point in my life where timing wise, like Momofuku was exploding and Ivan Orkin was exploding. So it was kind of like, whoa, there's this whole scene happening and I wanted to, I guess, jump in on it. And I knew I was moving back to Kansas City and there wasn't a ramen shop at the time. So I went for it. Tell me about the concept of the restaurant, like where you've chosen to put it and the experience that you want people to have when they come in. Mm -hmm. I mean, location was kind of luck. I think it's a great area and I kind of fell into it, but it was, man, two years I was looking for a spot. This one just came up. As soon as I saw it, it was open. I called Landlord, jumped on it, and he brought us in and uh, came with this funky design. I that, love it. You know, it just worked. Now, a lot of places will buy their noodles, mm -hmm. but you make your noodles here, so I know that you love noodles, but why do you bother to make them yourself? Because that can't be easy. Going into it, I knew that that was the main reason I wanted to do ramen, was I wanted to make my noodles, and I was going to do everything in-house and make everything from scratch. It wasn't really another route for me to take, in my opinion. <laughs> Ramen noodles aren't like Italian pasta noodles. They have a different texture. Yeah. And is it that they're alkaline? Yeah, it's an alkaline noodle. It's what gives it the kind of, a little bit of a yellow color, but the, the chewiness and the sturdiness to hold up in the, the hot broth while you eat the soup. Some stories go from, the noodles come from China and the water from the lake that they got, you know, their water from had a real high alkalinity level. And I'm not sure if that's exactly true, but that's kind Good of one story. of those. Old wives' tales, it's kind of cool, I like to believe, that yeah, they're definitely their own type of noodle versus egg noodles and all the other noodles out there. They're the alkaline noodle. And they come in different shapes, like some are more straight, some are wavy. Do you stick with a certain shape for your ramen? Do you uh, make different kinds? Our main noodle that we use in the majority of our bowl is the straight noodle, um, but our Sapporo bowl that we have right now has the wavy noodle, and then the tonkotsu broth that we do has a really small, super fine noodle. So there's tons of different kinds of noodles in ramen. Most people think of the wavy ones that come in a package. Yeah, that's because they bought it for uh -huh. 10 cents when they were in yeah, college. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the reason why we're here is that these soft cooked eggs are this amazing part of a bowl of ramen. The texture of the egg and the way that the yolk kind of enriches the broth. Kind of talk to me about using the eggs and what they do like in terms of changing the flavor of the soup. Yeah, egg's a big part of ramen. Um, and there's two types. You know, you see the soft boiled egg with the set white and the, the loose yolk in the middle. And then we do the slow cooked egg. Kind of looks rawish. It's more of one that you stir into the broth and it makes it kind of a velvety, richer texture. You know, it thickens it and just changes the whole bowl. Can we get in the kitchen? Yeah. All right, let's go. Do you get your eggs from anyone in particular? Uh, Buttonwood Farms. I love them. Yeah, and they're the nicest people ever. They're so great with us. So, good eggs coming good eggs. from Buttonwood. And how many eggs do you go through in a week, say? We try to keep about 120 eggs a day cooked. A day? Mm-hmm. But we'll go through 60 to 90 eggs a day. This is essentially an immersion circulator. Mm -hmm. Put water in it, bring it up to, we use 63 Celsius, but it's the same as 145. It just feels more sophisticated mm -hmm. to use Celsius. It's a 63 degree egg. I that's right, to. that's right. So all you do is put these in and then walk away for 45 yeah. minutes. Yeah, we set a timer and go about our other projects and then pull them out, put them in an ice bath and they're ready for service that night. So what type of ramen are you gonna show us today? I guess Shio is our kind of flagship bowl. It's mm -hmm. what we're named after. It's my favorite bowl. It's real clean and bright, simple. So while we have a moment, let's talk about that broth. The difference between a shio broth is, is the do, salt. It's a chicken and dashi broth, double broth. Yeah, and then we just season it with sea salt, ginger, garlic, scallion. Nice. All right, well, let's get in the kitchen and see. Okay. I'm gonna step out of the way and Patrick is going to work his magic in the kitchen.
All right, for our shio, we start with our shio tare, we call it, which is sake, sea salt, ginger, garlic, and scallion. And then the next in the bowl is the fat, which is the chicken and pork fat that we cook with green onions. It's an important element to the bowl as it floats on top of the broth, keeps the heat there, and also helps everything stick to the noodles as you eat it. We'll drop the noodles, which we cook for one minute. And then while those are cooking, we'll add the broth. And once the noodles are done, we'll add those to the bowl. And then we'll come over here and put the toppings on. The shio comes with chicken breast. It's just kind of roasted in the oven after we marinate it with soy sauce and then the pork chasu, and then this is just the braised daikon. The scallions go in the middle, and then the finisher on this one is black garlic oil, which is literally, we burn garlic with oil and blend it up. It just adds this whole depth of flavor, and that's it, that's our shio. So we've seen how traditional Japanese ramen is made. Let's now head to the kitchen and make a Midwest version, of course, including a soft cooked egg. So we've seen the breadth of how eggs can be used and I really thought it would be fun to focus in on making ramen today because it's that magical kind of six minute egg that really makes ramen in my mind so special. So I'm gonna make a ramen that is easy to produce at home. It is using just boxed broth, a little bit of miso, and then we're gonna dress everything up with some fried chicken and those beautiful eggs. So I'm gonna start off first by getting my chicken thigh is ready. I just have four chicken thighs. I'm gonna pound them out, make them nice and thin between two pieces of wax paper, and then I'm going to bread them in panko so they're nice and crunchy. I'm going to take my eggs, just break them into this pie plate. I'm gonna season the eggs with just a tiny little bit of soy and add in just a touch of water. Just like any other fried chicken, you're going to take the chicken thigh, dip it in, make sure you press down so all the panko adheres, shake off the excess and repeat with your remaining chicken thighs. All right, I'm gonna head over to the stove. My chicken is right here and I've been preheating my oil. It's just neutral oil. You can use pretty much any oil that you want that is appropriate for frying. I also have a pot of simmering water that is coming up to the boil and I'm going to lower my eggs in before it actually fully boils. And I'm hitting the start button on my timer because these eggs need to cook for exactly six minutes. And you really are looking for that beautiful, silky, custardy yolk. That's what makes this particular way of cooking the egg just so amazing. So I'm letting that sit, bringing it up to the boil. And while I'm waiting for that, I'm gonna go ahead and start frying my chicken. Five, four, three, two, one. Taking these guys out, I'm gonna put them directly into an ice bath, which is just a bowl full of ice water. It will stop the cooking, and we're gonna have perfect eggs. My chicken is nice and brown, it's all golden. So I'm gonna go ahead and move it over here to drain on this paper towel. And I'm gonna add my second batch of chicken to the oil, and I'm also gonna go ahead and boil my ramen noodles. Ramen is one of those dishes where there are a lot of different versions. People can be absolute purists about ramen, but when you look at all the different styles of ramen that come from Japan, you can see that just like any other kind of ubiquitous dish in different regions, people approach it in different ways. So feel free to play around with it. Even if it's not authentic, it will still be delicious. All right, I 
think we're there. I'm gonna go ahead and drain these and I'm just gonna hold them off to the side. They'll be added to the bowl when we finish up the broth. I have on the stove just a few cups of chicken broth and I'm going to add in some of these other ingredients. I have a little bit of sugar. You just want a teaspoon or so. And if you're looking for the recipes, they're all at feastmagazine.com. There's a Feast TV section on the website and all of the recipes from the series are there. Now a little bit of soy sauce, about two tablespoons or so. This is sake. We're gonna add a good dose. And as I mentioned, I am making a miso ramen, and so this is miso paste. If you love Japanese cuisine, it's the kind of flavor that is very light and it's beautiful. It is really, really tasty. Okay, this is ready. I'm gonna go ahead and assemble my ramen. Taking some noodles putting them in the bottom of my bowl, and then I'm gonna ladle my broth on top. Chop up a couple of these green onions, just a few bean sprouts. Enoki mushrooms, I love these mushrooms, they're like little fairy mushrooms. Beautiful. We're gonna get a little bit of chicken. This is my nori, it's just a sheet of seaweed. Now, the egg. You just quickly cut it. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay, now we just put a little bit of chili oil on. There you have it. Homemade ramen, quick and easy, and also very good for you. So I am going to pair my ramen with a Vidal Blanc from Baltimore Bend. I chose Vidal Blanc because it's very fruity and it has a slight hint of sweetness, which is going to go really nicely with those kind of Japanese flavors. So I hope you enjoyed our examination of the incredible edible egg and that you're inspired to kind of play around with new uses for eggs at home. Cheers, and I will see you next time.